I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Welcome back to RX Muscles History of Bodybuilding. I'm Dave Palumbo, and today is the 20th anniversary of the death of the original steroid guru, Dan Duchesne. And to commemorate him and remember him and bring back some great stories of Dan's life, I have uh, three great guys here. I have John Romano, of course, you all know. Michael Zampano, who is the co-author of the original uh, Underground Steroid Handbook. He also is the owner of Champion Nutrition back in the day. Uh, welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you, Dave. And uh, John Salami, who, John, you got to turn your phone sideways on me. And uh, John was a good friend of Dan's, and he's going to tell us some personalized stories as well. Thank you for joining me. And actually, thank you for, for actually getting me to do the show, because it was your idea. I want to hear the legend speak. I really do. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> John, let's start with you. Uh, you, I believe you lived with Dan, right, for a number of years? No, not at all. John did. I no, no, Roma I'll, I'll just no, call no, you no. Romano so we can differentiate between the two, John. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Salami yeah. and Romano, that's how I'm going to call you guys. Two beautiful <laughs> Jew, little Jewish guys, you know, we know from the back of the day. No. Italian, yeah, David. I know, yeah. I'm kidding around. No, we, didn't, we didn't live together. Uh, well, I mean, unless you call being convicts at the same prison camp living together. That's what I was referring to. I didn't know if you were going to bring it up, but I'm glad you No, did. We, weren't, we, weren't, we weren't cellies or anything, <laughs> but we, when, when we got out and moved to Venice. What are the odds of you two being in the same prison? I know, right? <laughs> but uh, w when we got out, we both we both moved into the same um, apartment building. He, he, I had the apartment in the front on Vernon Avenue, right next to the gym, and I lived in the front apartment, and he lived on the second apartment. We actually shared a wall. That was so. Did Dan have like a secret door in that wall? An escape What's hatch. That? Did Dan have like a secret escape hatch in that wall? No, but I did have a cutout in there where he kept all the bottles of tests and shit, you know, the, oh. walled in just in case. That's what, I, that's what I was referring to, yeah. He used to, he used to give, put it in from the other side and I used to take yeah, it out. Yeah, like it's like, <laughs> like a lazy Susan. You could just kind of spin it and, you know, and get your supplies. Dan, it, it, interestingly, Dan Duchesne was actually from Maine and he actually trained at the same gym as Chris Aceto. And I remember Chris telling you stories about when he was a – when he was a uh, you know, younger bodybuilder in the gym, and he would see Dan, and he would actually be afraid of Dan because he would hear all these stories about Dan with anabolics, and Chris didn't know anything about uh, steroids. So ironically, our whole RX muscle team has some kind of like, um, some except me. I, it's funny, I had very little contact with Dan ever. I had I met him once, and just we kind of talked briefly. But um, Mike, let's go to you. I mean, you had you uh, were pretty good friends with Dan. You obviously wrote the Underground Steroid Handbook with him. Give me the whole, how did you meet Dan first? Yeah, you know, it's, it, I, I think it's hard to remember a little bit. I mean, it was 40 years ago, right? But, uh, but in, my, in my head, I think Dan showed up at the gym, and I think it was either late 81, maybe early. Uh, you know who would know exactly was Sean Assel, the guy that wrote uh, Steroid Nation. Right, he right. Did a, now you're talking about Gold's Gym Venice, of course, just to confirm. Yeah, just to this is Gold's Gym in Venice Beach. And um, and uh, so Dan Dan kept trying to talk to me. And I didn't I didn't know who he was. I, I I didn't know why he wanted to talk, you know. And then one day he brings me a pie and he said he brought it back all the way from New York on an airplane. <laughs> and he gives me this pie. <laughs> right. And I I didn't know what to do with it. I put it in the refrigerator and I, I don't think I ever ate it. I, I didn't, <laughs> you know. but, uh, but yeah, then one day, uh, he showed up at Sunday school and I guess, I, I don't know if your viewers know, but I used to give a, like a Sunday class at Gold's gym on anabolic steroids. And it was like at 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday and anybody that could get up would come to it, pull the, pull the, uh, 
you know, benches over and people would sit. And then I printed out this syllabus that I give to people. And uh, what had happened was I had a best friend that was getting his Ph.D. in theoretical physics at Caltech. And he was like only 18 years old. He was a genius. And he had a research assistant. So he copied off, his research assistant copied off every piece of research ever done on anabolic steroids, including, you know, Russian and East German stuff. She had, she had everything translated for me, the research assistant. Did. Wow. So as I read that, you know, I keep refining these, these, uh, you know, these syllabuses. And um, I think we actually mimeographed them at one point. At one time, the first ones I think were mimeographed. John, guys, what, what's a mimeograph machine? Do you, <laughs> right? oh, People don't even know me. what you're talking about. <laughs> no, no, it's this thing you crank and and the it, the ink is blue and you expose it to ultraviolet light. It was before Xerox. Yeah, it was before yeah. actually a photocopy machine existed. I remember yeah. it, was, it was called the Ditto machine. The Ditto machine, the right? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> they were Dittos. But anyway, uh, one day Dan showed up there. And I didn't have, I'd run out of syllabus, syllabuses, syllabi, and I uh, handed him mine. And when, it, after the class, he came back, it was covered with notes. I mean, backside, frontside, like he was scribbling as fast as he could. And he was like, can we, can we go out to breakfast? Or, you know, I want to talk to you about this. I think there's a book here. And so... Uh, I don't know if I ever would have published it. I think I, I might have, but it wouldn't have been as good, you know, if I'd done yeah. it myself. So he picked me up on his moped one morning, and <laughs> the two of us, you know, <laughs> bodybuilders on the back of the moped, <laughs> you know, went to breakfast. And, it, I mean, on that first morning, uh, we kicked some names around, and uh, I, he liked the name Underground. I liked the name handbook you know and so it, it came together the underground steroid handbook that's funny. and uh, yeah it was uh, it, it was uh, kind of a neat deal i think i was 20 24 at the time maybe do, and uh yeah do, dan do and i think, spent every day mike do you think days. that you i mean i think it seems as though you guys or you probably i mean dan was kind of like the marketer of the book for you but you actually were the first person to actually put out information on how to take steroids. I don't think anyone really knew anything about it, did they, before that? Well, um, uh, James Wright, you remember James? Uh, James did a little bit of work. He had a PhD. And mm. then, actually, Pete Grimkowski published some really good stuff in uh, Muscle and Fitness back in about that time. Uh-huh. But, you know, nobody really had a book that was readable. James James's book was like a telephone book and it was written like a, a PhD would have written it. Uh, so it wasn't really accessible. So ours had cartoons in it. Yeah. Dan found a, an out of work Disney cartoonist. And, <laughs> uh, you know, you were saying that we, we originally, we Xerox the book. Well, we had a printer and he was an out of work printer. He had a printing press in his garage. He was an alcoholic <laughs> and we actually got him to print some books but I mean, we had to go stand with him and, uh, you know, he finally fell off the backside. So Dan and I, just as the book was getting popular, we're heading to the, uh, you know, to, to print these things out and Xerox them off every day at, at the local place. And I think we were paying two cents a sheet at the time to have wow. Xerox. What did you, what did you charge for the book at the time? Well, we charged $6. And then we realized that was way too cheap. We yeah. tried to increase the price. We sold some books at $20 and nobody had a, a problem paying 20 bucks for the book, but we didn't, we would have had to redo our ad. So what we tried to do was sell the books wholesale at $6. Uh, and we sold a lot of books to Europe and Australia and, and all over. So that was most of our books sold uh, through distributors you know, in other countries. Right. So we sold books to South Africa, uh, to uh, the, the um, Arab countries, Lebanon. Yeah, I mean, everywhere. We sold books all over the world. Mike, back at that time, like if, if someone would have come up to you and Dan and said, hey, what's, what's, what's the best cycle to put on a lot of mass? What was like, what was like, the, like a cutting edge cycle at that time? 
Dan liked Anadrol. Dan liked, um, well, Finijek was a little more for getting, you know, in contest ready. But Dan liked Anadrol. I tended for mass. I tended to like Dianabol. Anadrol just made people too tough to deal with. <laughs> Dianabol was bad enough. What was the dosages guys were using the back then? For, for the stack, um, you know, there... Uh, I mean, nothing was better than Parabolin. I, I like Parabolin, yeah. and the French Parabolin was available, mm. and so I I like the Parabolin. It didn't make you as fat as uh, as just a lot of straight testosterone. Um, Deca, lots of Deca, um, and uh, when you say guys use lots of Deca, what were dosages, guys? Do you remember? You know, at the time, everybody took three thousand migs a week. Oh, something like that. Oh, guys were taking and, that much gear, huh, back then? All together. Yeah, if you added yeah. it all. Oh. Yeah, all the all the injectables plus the the orals, you know, 3,000 migs a week. Um, but it got worse from there. I mean, then guys started doing 6,000 migs a week, and right. some guys did, you know, twice that. It just got crazy. John. Um, oh, yeah. But the, you know, the bottom line was the more you took, the bigger you got. <laughs> there yeah. didn't see any, it seemed to be any law of, uh, you know, uh, decreasing effectiveness as the dosages got higher. Hmm. And uh, so guys did it. And, uh, you know, they blowed up. You'd have these guys go up to 300 pounds in the off season and then they'd cut down to 180 for the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, just insane. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe they're still doing it. Probably. Yeah. John Romano, what was what was your first encounter with uh, with Dan Duchesne? Actual, f real... Well, I mean, I used to see him in the gym. You know, I knew who he was. Right. Um, but but I didn't actually meet and talk to him in any, to any length other than to say hi. Was in prison. We were in the we were in Boron Federal Prison Camp together. When did you first realize that when you when you got in here there was he there already or did he get there after you? He was already there. He was already there. I I, I was I found a weight first day. I found a weight pile. You know, yeah. and went walked over there and then I looked up and I go, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> what what a chance meeting, right? There's no way. Nothing's a coincidence. I don't believe you know. It was, I mean, the stars could not possibly have lined up any better because that meeting there launched my entire career. Yeah. What, so, you know, that, that was it. What was Dan in there for at that point? Because I know he had gone in twice, right? I That one was for a, uh, the steroid beef. He had, he was, it got, I think got, caught importing or selling or well something. no what what actually I'm happened, not sure what happened Dan Mike? Dan got uh uh well I, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole but you know I had champion and I and Dan was in the steroid business he knew he was being tracked by the feds so I went down uh he was with Caroline Kunkus at the time and uh do, do you guys did you guys know her uh, I knew or, Caroline yeah Caroline was he and, dating her and uh, <laughs> huh? He was dating this girl. Yeah, they were oh. living together, and and Caroline was, she wasn't real precise sometimes about stuff. So Dan would tell her, "Don't ship this stuff from our house," <laughs> but she did. Dan well, says she was mildly retarded. <laughs> okay, I. <didn't. laughs> um, but anyway, so I got Dan to kind of leave it all behind in the middle of the night. We moved him up to Benicia. I got him a place on the water, a really nice place. And then he came to work for me at, at uh, Champion. He was miserable. Um, Dan had a lot of issues with substances. So he was taking something like 100 milligrams of Valium a day at the oh time. Oh, my God. Yeah. And uh, and he was, he was an unhappy guy. He really liked being a, a, a gangster. You know, that that appealed to him and he left it behind. Anyway, when when they got to Benicia, Caroline shipped some steroids to her friend out of state oh. and the feds were watching and they caught that. Oh. Now, the thing that made the prison term shorter was the fact that there were no steroids in it. In oh. other words, he was punching tablets at the time. They couldn't get their I guess they couldn't get their shipment of roids in from China. So they. They were punching tablets with nothing. 
Oh and my God, <laughs> it was fake. So they couldn't get him for a steroid charge. They got him for a trademark violation. Ah. Oh. And uh, and that's what the that's what the charge was. He never got a steroid charge. So, yeah. Mike, back in the day, they, they were still importing Ross from China, even back then in the in the eighties, nineties. I actually, I don't know if they, it was coming from China. He was having everything made in Mexico, so wow. so I, I'm assuming that even then it was being made in China. But uh, I could be wrong. Maybe they were made in a lab in Mexico. You know, no, the Ross are from China. Oh, they were. That's yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it was fu it's funny. Both of his charges were interesting interpretations of the law. They, they, they. I mean, the second time around, they just had to get him. I mean, it, and it was, it was. I think it was for the the uh, clenbuterol, or the. I think it was for clenbuterol that he 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 just was selling it with no label on it, and that and he got a complaint, I guess, from somebody, and the FDA, the FDA. Um, followed it up and they and in order to in order to avoid the compliance with the FDA's label requirements Dan just left the label off <laughs> and, and, and 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 it was a very broad interpretation of the law that got him the charge but really what he told me was that he had been testifying in too many um steroid cases as a as a you know witness for the defense and the and the apparent coup de gras, which nailed his coffin shut with respect to the, the the district attorney, was that the the government's witness, um, when questioned by the the defense attorney, asked the government's witness, "Where do you get your knowledge about steroids?" And the government's witness points to Dan in court. <laughs> I read his book. <laughs> Which is really Mike's book, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, they said, we got to get rid of this guy. So, I mean, because I mean, if you look at what he actually was put away for the second time, it was it was a fucking bullshit charge. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they do that. when uh, Before the first charge, the FBI was all over him. And they were actually all over me, too. Uh, we were hiring a lot of temps at the time because Champion was growing really fast. And this one girl came in. She was in really good shape. And she was a uh, just going to be a data entry person. Well, it turned out she was an FBI agent. No way. I, oh, my God. Of, I was kind of on my guard because she looked at a custom program that I wrote myself. And she called it Lotus One Two Three, which was a popular spreadsheet program right. like Excel at the time. So I knew she was kind of a shill, and yeah. uh, immediately, I mean, like first day, she started asking me questions about steroids, and she wow. asked me about girls using steroids, and I was—I I still remember her name. I'm not going to say it, but yeah. you know, and and I—I I was Joni kinda, Brasco. <laughs> Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Statue of limitations is long over. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't want to get into it. She still lives in Vallejo, so. Oh wow. Anyway, um, but uh, anyway, so I, you know, I kind of dodged that bullet. But they were, you know, they were looking at me too, and um, and I'd kind of stayed clean. I, you know, the story. I'd sold Dan the book when when Dan started dealing drugs. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be part of that. And so I, I sold him the publishing company for what he had in his wallet at the time, which was like $200. And the first, the first drug deal that Dan did went really bad. Uh. And he borrowed some money from a pretty bad guy in England. You know, you see the like lock, stock and two smoking barrels, right? You see that show of the yeah. guys feeding people pigs. One of those guys, right? Oh. <laughs> we owed we owed that guy money, so I was a little pissed, and uh, yeah, I sold him the company for a couple of hundred bucks, and I walked away. I left I left L.A. entirely when that started, and I went and lived in New York, and uh, I had a great time in Manhattan, you know. <laughs> so uh, that's how it kind of transitioned from me, you know, me being Dan's partner to just not. And, well, you were being yeah. sucked in there, obviously, by association, obviously, is what was happening, right? Yeah, yeah. But I wanted to do the sports nutrition thing. You know, that's what I really cared about. A lot of people don't know, Mike, you were the first person to really put out a meal replacement shake with Metabolol, right? 
Yeah, I mean, it was it was high tech at the time. And, and it's still all those things that we had in metabolol are still being used. Like people are still using branching complex carbohydrates. Right. They're not using, you know, in the before that, those drinks were full of whey powder. Whey powder is lactose. Milk. So yeah, it was just milk basically. Yeah. Turned straight to gas, you yeah. know. <laughs> so whey powder is just whey is a sugar, right? It's only six percent protein. Right. And uh, so you know, we we came up with branching complex carbs. Came up with that in the seventies, actually. And then the um, uh, and then the car, the fat we were using was MCTs. So cool. I started using MCTs with athletes back in the seventies too. What was your and protein source back then? It was complicated. I mean, we had everything from we wanted a mix of molecular weights. So we had egg protein, which was the largest casein whey. I had. Um, Later on, I had the uh, meat protein, you know, which oh, I didn't now even know you did that. Yeah, I didn't know you really did that. Now people sell it as carnivore, right? We had yeah, the meat beef, protein. Beef ice that was the protein in heavyweight gainer 900. Oh. And then we had amino acids to make up the, the protein blend. So we got a, a PER of 4.0, you know. Yeah. And protein so we looked at all the rating. research yeah. about, uh, you know, what amino acid profile athletes really use. There was a book by uh, George Blackburn uh, and Dr. Adibi and Dr. Young about amino acids. And I got a lot of data from there. It was hard. I mean, people have to remember there was no internet back then. No. So it's tough to get that information. But yeah, it was a great product. I think it'd still be a great product today. But, um, you know, I'm off doing other things. Yeah. John <laughs> Solani, how did you meet Danny yes. Shane? Um, well, I had moved uh, from New Jersey to uh, Orange County to race BMX, and I was at the Blocks Gym uh, with Troy Zuccolato, Sean Ray, Dennis Newman. This was 8990, uh, and I saw an ad in Modern Bodybuilding newspaper, Jason Mathis, I think, yep. uh, and it said consultations. So I'm like, well, I'm training athletes. I was a bodybuilding fan since 84, I, my first muscle and fitness. But I, I really wasn't competitive. I, I did a competition in 85 as a team. Terrible. Got third, whatever. But I was at this gym, and, and I said, well, I want to – much like everyone here, I, I have to increase my research and knowledge. So I go, this guy does consultations for $40. I'll give him a call. I'm training athletes. I want to make my athletes the best. So I called. And uh, went up to the Vernon house, John, and, and I apologize for yelling because remember Dan would say, just come to the front gate and yell my name. So, John, if you're sleeping or something, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I yelled, Dan, Dan, from the back to the back house, right? Um, so I went and had this consultation and I was like, wow, the first thing, and, and everybody here can probably attest to this, but Dan is so absorbed. He, he draws you in with this knowledge, right? But then when you get this knowledge, you're like, God, he's half crazy. Wait, but he's wait, so wait, knowledgeable. Wait, wait, wait. Let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you, you got to flavor the scene just a second because he's, Dan is so eccentric. He's giving you this knowledge while he's in a bathrobe with slippers in a lazy boy. You know, leave the, old, the lazy boy your aunt had with the handle on the side, you know. Right. You know, right. And it was only missing the doily and, <laughs> on, on the headrest. So he, he's and he's got the, the lamp next to him, you know, and he's sort of pontificating from his from his throne there. And you're sitting, you know, yeah. You're absorbed. So I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that, no, it's John, John, interrupt me at any time, please. Uh, so so he's giving this knowledge, and all the American gladiators are coming in and out of the house as he's as he's telling me this, and I'm going. So I'm put. I'm, I was naive. Trust me. Uh, you know. So I'm. But like, wow, I'm putting it all together. And uh, he never charged me any amount of, for any information from that point till his death because we had similar interests. He was into recumbent bikes, uh, antique uh, audio systems, muscle cars. So I would talk to him about that. And then we'd touch upon training athletes. But it was odd that I, I was so drawn in by accessing all this knowledge about so much. Like, John, you mentioned a ton of times, like he knew so much about so many different things that I would talk about, you know, my buddy's going to Mexico, da, 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 da. that's a whole nother story. But what do you think about this bicycle? And he would talk to me and I was racing professional cycling and he knew all the intricacies of bikes. And I was like, wow. So he became a friend more than I would say someone that I, I would like 
call the steroid guru, right? But the knowledge was was amazing. And I met him through that newspaper and I never paid after that till his death and and so many great stories. And I, I, I went to lunch with him the day before he's incarcerated at the firehouse with Shelly Harvey. And I'm like, that's a whole nother story. Like, I, I, I really want to do this, David, because I have so many stories of him. And I still got my dirty dieting newsletters, everyone. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> How about that? Huh? That's good. If you want me to copy these for you guys, I will. But, uh, yeah, he was he, – he was uh, – I don't know. It, it's not like I, – I know he's branded as a steroid guru, but John, you know, and, and, and ab- absolutely Michael, that as a human being, you're, like, fascinated by him. But his advice was so wrong that you're like, why would I do this, right? You know, the Anadrol thing. Well, I'm not I'm not throwing off Anadrol. We'll just do another one. That's not the best choice, Dan. But for him, it was or or, you know, uh, try DMSO. It's it's awesome. You'll you'll get what? Like, what do you? So I, I, I loved him as a as a unique person. But it's funny that his his words were like, I don't know. You have to second guess his advice is what I'm trying to say. There yeah, I mean, I'll just interject when. Go ahead, when please. I met Dan, when I met Dan, he was taking 17 different drugs. <laughs> so Dan Dan actually hired me. I was training people at Gold's. Yeah. And he came upstairs where my my apartment slash office was, where I live, <laughs> up above Gold's gym. And, uh, you know, and he kind of laid everything out for me. And I'm like, Dan, this is unbelievable. I took him down to three drugs. Right. And he got the biggest he'd ever gotten in his life. We did that rebound training system, and he got up to about 240 at one point. Wow. Uh, kind of, kind of heavy I and mean, kind of fat, but you know, 240. But yeah, Dan, Dan just was a kitchen sink kind of guy. I mean, you know, if uh, take it until you piss blood, and then cut back. <laughs> just and uh, if one is good, ten is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was his advice to all of us, and we're like, I. If you're rational thinking, you're like, I, I don't know if that's the best advice, Dan. I'm intrigued by your knowledge, but I don't know if your advice is something I really want to. And a lot of people yeah. did, man. How about those the, stories? The, Holy cow. The one interaction yeah. I had with him, I was asking him about something about women. He was at a seminar he did at Bob Bonham's gym, Strong and Shapely. And he was like, I don't know why these guys all use, like, with women, Anavar and Winstrel and Prima Bowen. And he goes, that's all garbage. Just give him a quarter of an Anadrol a day. Oh. Is that true, John? <laughs> Romano? Well, well he, he Dan was Dan was famous for being able to corral a bunch of women who were just willing lab rats who would just yeah. do anything that he, he said. So, and they would never be the same again. No, no, no he ru- ruined them. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, but but they willingly followed the Pied Piper, you know. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he whatever they whatever. I mean, I was sta- I remember standing there with I won't say her name, female bodybuilder going into the Olympia. I was helping him with her, and <clears throat> actually, he sort of pawned her off on me. Was the real story? And <laughs> we're standing in the in her bathroom, or she's in the bathroom. I'm outside the bathroom door, and he's and we're looking at her in the mirror, and her and her quad kept cramping. So. Um, he said, let me try this. And he opens his b- fanny pack and he pulls out a syringe and pulls like, I don't know, some measure of, of uh, lidocaine out of into an insulin <laughs> syringe. He goes, let me see if this works. And he just stuck it in her calf. <laughs> and she just let him, you know, and that was, it worked. But um, <laughs> that's the kind of, that's the kind of power, mystique, whatever you want to call it, he had. Um, he you know, should have been a cult a, leader, it sounds like. Well, it was a broad range of women, and there were always these kind of like A-team of misfits. There was something wrong with all of them, you know. And <laughs> and, and, and but, but in a savant way sometimes, you know. I mean, one, one was a concert cellist. I mean, there was, you know, some interesting, although Trevelyan was a train wreck. But, um, <laughs> the, I mean, you know, from all, all – but never like the girl next door, you know. There was – Never any of that. Who was the girl who lost but, her legs because of the calf implants? Well, yeah, that was yeah, that was sad, very sad. What but, happened with that, Mike? Well, uh, she wanted very large breasts and very large calves, and Dan was uh, Dan liked that too, and they wouldn't do it in the U.S. She wanted, you know, basketballs, and they'd only do 
<laughs> I don't know, 750 cc's in the U.S. or something like that. Right. She wanted twice that. So, uh, so she went to Mexico for that. And then when it came time to get calf implants, uh, she went to Mexico to get the calf implants. They wouldn't do it in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they got these implants that were very, very large in the calves. Um, and as the tissue swelled after the surgery, it cut off the artery to her lower legs uh. and just kept hitting her up with, with um, uh, sedatives. So by the time she was aware and by the time they were aware that there was something wrong, the tissue was dead. They did everything they could do, but it had already clotted. They had to remove her one leg um, below the knee. Ugh. And they and then she lost a foot, I think. And then they tried to, I mean, she's a bodybuilder, right? Right. So they try to take muscle to make a pad for her foot and her knee, and the pad dies. So they pulled off one trap, and they pulled off one lat. Ugh. Oh, she was just a, a mess. They did this I mean, all in Mexico, Mike? Yeah. Oh. Well, I don't think they did the uh, the final surgeries in Mexico. They took her up to Scripps for that yeah, was insane. what I remember. Yeah. Wow. You know? But, uh, yeah, it's kind of sad. And then one, one girlfriend uh, was in the military. He got her to make a, a porn film, and I think she ended up in Leavenworth for that. Oh, my God. It, How it, terrible. It, <laughs> his wife Shelly, uh, he didn't believe in helmets, so they were on the freeway, and he hit an abutment, uh, oh. an overpass, I guess, and she lost one hemisphere, and oh she my was a God. little, little I'm, out of it. I'm, I'm still friends with her now on Facebook. Wow, she's, she's doing wow. Good. yeah. It was. Yeah, a, she, I thought it was a blowout. He didn't have a blow tire blowout on the on the moped. Yeah, maybe that's what it was. I yeah. don't remember. That's yeah, crazy. but Helix, the yeah. Honda Helix. Yeah, yeah. So. He had a sketchy history with his women, right? Terrible. Yeah. And, what and don't and don't let's not forget the, the the that all of them were or some most of them were concomitant new new bane addicts as well. <laughs> right. Yeah. Dan and I would get together in the after he got out. Um, uh, no, no, no. This was before he ever went in. So maybe this was in the mid '80s. Yeah. And uh, we used to go to the Nam shows. You know the the music shows. Yeah. And. Uh, Man, he would every two hours he'd have to check into a bathroom and hit up. <laughs> and if he didn't, you didn't want to be within thirty feet of him. Really? He would, uh. he, oh, he he'd fight with anything. He'd fight with a trash can. He, he was. <laughs> uh, it was it was real tough. And he got everybody on it. And he kept telling him, "It's not addictive. It's not addictive." Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. I I, I felt oh, he, I he, felt. He, 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 he spoke of it like a long lost lover in prison. Yeah. I mean, this was the best thing. Ever ever and then you know when we got out we were in that apartment on vernon i remember i was literally up on a ladder doing some installing a track light or something and he comes in we all had back doors we had a, the front door and a back door went into the kitchen and he and i had we, not, we just walked into each other's houses and and uh, i'm up there on the ladder and he come he comes walking in and he holds up an insulin syringe and he goes, come on down off of that ladder, John. You don't want to be doing this up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, I, and it's like I had no choice. You yeah, know? yeah. And I said, all right, so I stuck my arm out. I said, you're going to hit me? He goes, don't be a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually think the best story you ever told me, John, forget the New Bane story, was when you guys were, were putting cat encapsulating DNP. <laughs> Did oh Mike know that God. story? Really? Yeah. This he is a had, story, Mike. Had, this is a great story. He had discovered in a, I guess, some law, some library of study on DNP, which was a, a, a poison. Actually, it's like dinitrophenol. Yeah, yeah. dinitrophenol. Yeah, it's, it's like a molecule away from DNT or something. It's TNT, dynamite. Like TNT, right? No, no, no. It's not. It's not even related. But oh no, no. Well, well, I mean. TNT would be uh, trinitrophenoline. This is phenol, so it's not. Yeah. I mean, it looks uh, similar, but yeah. But anyway, it was the theory behind it was it was an uncoupling agent. It would, it would, it would, it would in the in the ATP ADP cycle, it would uncouple the action. You would instead of creating energy, you would just lose it as heat, right. and so so it made you hot or feel hot anyway. 
So he, he gets some order of it from some chemical company, and it's uh, he's got a newspaper spread out on on a kitchen table with this mountain of yellow orange stuff on there, <laughs> and a big box of double O um, capsules, um, you know, cl clear plastic capsules. And he said, and and he's and he's like scooping them up and putting them together, you know. And he goes, "Come on!" And he told me to help him. So we're sitting there in the kitchen scooping up powder and stick in the capsule with our bare hands and i'm sitting there i'm going damn it's hot in here man are you got that heat on and and um he goes no i'm in a hot too and then he looks down he says our hands are yellow stained yellow okay and and it, it dawns on both of us it's going in through our pores you know and so here we are like think we're both gonna die you know in the middle of the night in in in, in this kitchen and that, yeah, that was we, we lived. You but. know, <laughs> DNP, DNP was so poisonous, and the trouble is, it would keep peaking in your body if you got it. You know, it would peak after you know maybe five days. So people would take it; they wouldn't get a reaction, they wouldn't feel anything, and then the next day or the day after, they'd take more. And then when it would all finally work, it would melt their liver down, because wow. it was you know what what it does is it your your liver keeps burning more and more energy to try to make enough ATP to get the tissue to survive, but it can't because it's an uncoupling poison. And so uh, I spoke to one time to Brian Batchelder when Dan and I were first talking about DNP. And uh, Brian said, hey, Brian, do you guys know who Brian yeah, is? Yeah, He's yeah. an English bodybuilder. Yeah. He, he told me, he said, don't fucking do it everybody's fucking dying over here that's even tried it you know and then uh we we did actually i think maybe mike menser and ray menser you know they died one one day apart from each other yeah and they both uh they both died of liver failure wow and you know i i don't know i have no you know knowledge of it but it it could have been dnp hmm. possibly wow um but it was it, it was pretty bad stuff and um, it would it would take you down, you know, it, it would because you're not able to make energy. You couldn't do anything with it. You felt like shit. Yeah. And uh, wasn't healthy. So you yeah. took it at, took it at night. And, and the downside of that was is you'd wake up in a puddle, yeah. you know, oh, I would soak the sheets, you know, I mean, absolutely soaking wet. You'd have to get up and lay on a towel. And, yeah, it was, there was no time to take it because if like Mike said, if you took it, it sapped all your energy. You couldn't train on it. You yeah. couldn't do cardio yeah. with it. It was, you were useless. So, hey, do you guys remember Curtis Leffler? Yes, very yeah, well. Yeah, of course. He okay, was my great. twin brother. Everyone thought we were the same guy. Oh, Curtis but, was a wonderful guy. Yeah, great guy. My wife loved him. They were they were good friends. We used to hang out in Hawaii, and um, I think Curtis died because of DNP too. Really oh, wow. interesting. Yeah. You know, there's an interesting story. I got pulled out. I was, I came in, my, my wife was, at the time, was doing a photo shoot with Flex Magazine, and they flew her in on, like, United Airlines, and I was a cheapo, so I went, remember Tower Air? It was like an Israeli airline. They flew from New York to California for, like, 100 bucks. So I flew on Tower. I got off the plane. I was standing outside in LAX waiting for her to get in on her flight, and the feds, the, the DEA came up, badges, they're like, uh, what are you doing here? You know, uh, you know, what are you standing around for? I said, well, I explained, I'm waiting for my wife. She's coming on another flight. And he's like, uh, you have any drugs on you? I said, no. Um, I, I did have steroids in my, in my bag. He goes, you mind, we, mind if we take a look? Um, he took my license. He's like, wanted my ID. And he's looking at my ID like, and looking at me, he goes, isn't your name Curtis? I said, I'm not going to come Dave Palumbo. <laughs> and they're going through my bag, and, they, and they're pushing the steroids out of the way, and I don't know what they were looking for, but they didn't find anything. They're like, you can go. They must have, because we looked alike a little bit, profile especially, um, and wow. people would get us confused. So I don't know what that was about or why they were looking for him, but um, it was weird. He was a, I always got along with him really well, though. He was a real nice guy. Yeah, I don't think there was anybody he didn't get along with. He was very yeah. red all the time, right? Wasn't he? <laughs> Like he looked very red, hypertensive, purple, purple. Yeah. What was that from? Yeah. You think? Yeah. Hypoxia. Too much muscle and not enough blood, not enough uh, <laughs> oxygen. Wow. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, some guys have 
an 11 liter lung capacity and some guys have a two liter lung capacity, right. you know? So if you're 400 pounds and you don't have big lungs, <laughs> you, you might be purple. <laughs> oh, I, I, didn't, I never even thought about that, Mike. That's interesting that you say that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Don Ross used to call it the color of raw liver. He was <laughs> red. Don Ross was red all the time, too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think maybe for other reasons. Uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> Who invented well, Ultimate well, Orange? What's that? Who invented Ultimate Orange? Was that really Dan's? No, we did. We did. Yeah. Oh, was, that was you? It was, no, it was us together. Oh. I mean, we, what, what we did was we had a, uh, a straight chain complex carb that became the product Carboplex. Mm -hmm. So it was just maltodextrin. Right. And, and we, uh, we bought a flavor from a company called Alex Freeze. And that's what gave it the color of orange. We bought an orange flavor for it. Mm -hmm. And then we started looking for something. It was just the carbohydrate. We wanted to have something that would give it a kick. Right. right? And at the time, ephedra. So, you know, uh, we just threw ephedra in it and it, it would kick your ass. Of course, Dan went overboard with the ephedra. Very <laughs> <laughs> strong. But yeah, I think we sold it. Uh, I think the second printing of the underground steroid handbook, like right after we launched it, the, uh, uh, you know, maybe three months after we launched it, we had, uh, the, uh, ultimate orange on the back of it. That thing yeah. was, people had a cult following. The original ultimate orange was, was, was amazing. I remember my friend Vinnie Hanzik used to have a store in New York, the body shop, and he would sell hundreds of those things from that he used to get from Dan. Hundreds. Oh, yeah, it was a great big product. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Everybody yeah. talks about it. You know, we're, we're telling a lot of stories. That it's supposed to be a tribute, and it's coming out kind of like a cautionary tale. <laughs> well, I, what I think better it, tribute is there? Well, we don't want to, like, glamorize it too much, you know what I mean? Because he, he, he yeah. had a lot of great contributions to the, to the sport. In terms of, but but there was also a lot of you know stuff that you should avoid too. You know that he. Well, did. yeah, but to be fair, to be fair, I mean, to live in that realm at that time, you know, you got to take the good with the bad. I mean, you know, what, all of the you know foibles that you know we we kind of laugh about now were potentially catastrophic in the day. Yeah. But we still out of that got many many things that are still. You know, staples today, metformin, uh, clenbuterol, vanadyl sulfate, insulin. I mean, all, all of all of those things that he came up with or, you know, went broke into the UCLA, UCLA library and, you know, with a fake <laughs> ID and read the studies on him. You know, he, he did all that research for us. Did, you know, and did he find clenbuterol? Was he the guy who found it? I believe he was. That Mike would know, too. I think he yeah, was. Yeah, definitely. Dan... Dan wanted me to put when I when Dan was working with me at Champion. Dan wanted me to put clenbuterol in our products. He said, <laughs> "You know, you're going to make a lot more money because it won't dime. It's super cheap. A dose is ten micrograms. Nobody will ever." This was the '80s. There was no mass spectrometry, HPLC. Right, right. Anybody was doing. So he said, "Nobody will ever find it." <clears throat> and he said something to me about hiding it in a fat. So it, it was it was kind of an odd thing that he'd say that. And then he left me and he went and worked with another company. Right. I'm not going to say the company, but uh, in the ensuing years, we did get HPLC and we did test it. And that product had a uh, little clenbuterol in it. <laughs> really? And I notified the guy to take it out or or else. <laughs> and uh, he never spoke to me again, but he took it out. Yeah, you, you know who he's talking about, right? Dave? Is he no, talking no, about? Is he talking about it. my? No, my, I'm not going to say a name. I just said please don't we, we all, say. We, I'll be it, in a lawsuit. I won't. I know. I swear. Is it to God, my mentor, John? We we just. It's just nice that we all know who he's talking. Is it about. my yeah. mentor, John? <laughs> What's that? Is it my mentor? I, I'm not. Oh, oh my God! I didn't know that story. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you. All I know who that. you're talking about. All right, I, Mike. I got a better one. What was in the original hot stuff? Oh, G H B. G H B. You remember the hot stuff? No, that powder. It was like a. It was like a protein powder, but it had like every ingredient in the world in there. Yeah. 
They put GHB okay. in there? So you're asking me or you're asking I'm John? asking Zimpano, you, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it had GHB in it. And I think it also had clenbuterol in it, but I can't say for sure. Because Why would you mix those I two? <laughs> That's a speedball. I mean, why would you do that? Because yeah. I everyone yeah. thought that hot stuff had methyl testosterone in it. No. Too. No? <laughs> no. I didn't look. You know, it's funny. I didn't look for clenbuterol in it, but I did look for testosterone. I didn't find any testosterone in that it. Any type of Guys grew on that stuff, Mike, though. Yeah. It gave you yeah. the worst gas of all time. It was it was horrendous gas. I was in medical school at the time. I would take a dose of that in the morning. I was almost embarrassed to sit in the, in the lecture hall. I stunk so bad. Yeah. What was it from? It Why was did like, you get gas? Yeah, it was like a sulfur. It was like a sulfur fart you'd get from that hot stuff. Yeah. No, I I, I wish I could tell you. I'm not sure. <laughs> I figured if anyone knew, you would know. Dan's M.O. was to just put it in there, you know? I mean, it, it, it's like no, nothing had, like, one or two ingredients. It was always 45, you know? And who, who knows what the combinations made and, you know, interactions they right. had. And there, there's no way of knowing, you know? So it could have been a, metaboli a metabolization of some newly formed – a, you know, compound that your body put together with all these bits and pieces of, I mean, Lord knows you could make anything out of one of his products. Right. I mean, it was, well, you know, you know, they tried to take the FDA tried to take hot stuff on the, off the market. And eventually they did. They reformulated. You remember you guys, you guys all remember in the early nineties, Renutrient. Yeah. Right? GHB. That was, that was uh, similar to GHB. Yeah. And, uh, um, and I think the hot stuff guys finally, I think what got them taken off the market, and maybe somebody in your comments section will know, but I think it was that they found HB in the product. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. I wonder yeah. why they put it in there, because guys were using hot stuff to, to, to grow. I don't know how yeah. GHB would it, make it them increase grow. Increase GH. I don't, maybe. I don't know. Oh, there you go. Well, yeah. that's what GHB did. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Increase so, GH. Yeah. Yeah. People, I, mean, I was all know, natural when I took it, and people were accusing me in the gym of being on testosterone. They said, "You're, we know the look, you're on testosterone. I was taking three doses of that hot stuff a day. I was completely clean. I didn't even know what a steroid was. What but, a terrible accusation that you, you were taking steroids? <laughs> <laughs> so I figured if I was being accused of it, I might as well take them. That, that's how I started doing it. But yeah. <laughs> What do you think Dan's... Right. Let me go to Salami first. What, what was Dan's, like, probably greatest uh, contribution to bodybuilding? I'll, I'll, go, I'll ask each one of you. Let's start with Salami. Oh, man. Uh, uh, um, uh, pro hormones? or, or did, When he did design – Michael, you can back me on this. The, either way, I'm going to go with two because he, he brought so much. I would say either the way, when he did designer way, or uh, his uh, androstenedione, I think. Those two, the pro hormones. Yeah, that's me. You, you, well, th did Dan do pro hormones? Dan, Dan, I think Dan was the guy that weaponized Pat Arnold. Oh, really? <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Pat Arnold was a very bright chemist, a little on the spectrum. Uh, you know, <laughs> kind of a. He only wanted to talk about organic chemistry. Right. So one time Dan and Pat were were visiting me and um, <clears throat> I was a pilot and I had airplanes and Dan uh, Dan was getting into flying. And we took uh, a two minute aside from organic chemistry with Pat sitting there to discuss a new jet that was coming on the market, literally two minutes. And Pat was turning. 50 shades of red like he was squirming in his seat he was just like like what are you guys talking about and then later on my uh my business partner and i he walked in and my business partner said well what are you guys been talking about and pat blurts airplanes <laughs> and we've been talking you know for an hour and a half about uh about pro hormones and and chemistry right so i i do believe that dan was the guy that got 
Pat into it. Now, Pat can speak for himself. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he'll say otherwise, but yeah, definitely. Oh, so that's, a, that's a big contribution. Yeah. yeah, I didn't realize that. I thought that was all it's Patrick hard, Arnold. It's hard to nail it down because Dan did a lot, you know, from the beginning with the Underground Steroid Handbook. Um, you know, he's he's done, I mean, he did an awful lot of things. The the rant column that he wrote was real influential. That was you good. Were, yeah, that was really good, actually. In, yeah. Uh, Muscle Media rant. 2000. Yeah. 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 How did he meet Bill Phillips? Dan met Bill Phillips uh, through Scott Connolly. Oh, okay. And I think he met Scott Connolly. He might have met Scott Connolly through me because I knew Scott before then. Scott and I worked together a little bit up in uh, San Jose. Uh, I had Carboplex at the time. I was living in, in San Jose, and this was 1983. And Scott had the Ironworks gym and wanted to uh, wanted to make his own product. So I, I helped him a little bit. Uh, we never launched a product together, but I think maybe maybe it was through him. Do, do uh, you think, hold on, let me, I don't mean to interrupt you. Do you think that Connolly got the idea for Metrex from Metabolol? Because it seemed like that was a natural evolution from that, that product. Well, Dan, Dan told me that it was the, uh, because Scott was a doctor, yeah. It was the prescription form of metabolol because we called metabolol met <laughs> right. at the time. Met two, we had met met two, you know. Yeah. So this was Rex, but I don't know. I can't say that for sure. Right. You know. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> John, you know, one thing. I want to okay. say, one thing I want to get out about Dan and and John and John, you guys can can back this up and maybe you have some stories, but uh, Dan could characterize somebody. In a the first time he met him, the first time he saw their face, he could he was kind of a severe judge, but I mean he could nail it, you know he could identify someone and nail it. I had Dan one time, uh, he went to pick up somebody I was going to be working with uh, at an airplane, um, and when he met the guy, he told him. The first thing he said to him, he looked at him and he goes, well, you're some kind of faggot. I don't know what kind, but you're some kind of faggot. Just out of the blue. I mean, the guy was offended, right? And, uh, but, you know, and the guy wasn't gay. He liked uh, transsexuals. That was his thing. But, I mean, but, but Dan nailed it. You know, he, identified, he knew there was something there. He could like, he could like nail things and he did it to me all the time i probably won't tell you what he said about me but i mean it, he he just could could nail it you know nailed it with my wife nailed it with everybody that, that worked with with us you know so uh, maybe he was psychic he didn't tell anyone no nah, it's that blink phenomenon dan was very very smart and uh you know he was a he had a sad upbringing i uh, i mean you know he was he was adopted <laughs> His adopted parents both died when he was, I think, 13 years old. Um, one, uh, his mother died in an airport, and he was, you know, a little kid, uh, terrible, alone in an airport. And then nobody really wanted to adopt him. Um, I mean, he had a rough upbringing, and I think that colored a lot of his, uh, you know, his personality and his character, and, and his problems with drug addictions too. You know, John Romano, you want to comment? What, 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 what would you think Dan's best contribution was to the sport? And if you have your own insights, like Mike gave us, you want a summation? I think, it would, I think it would have to be his ability in building off of what Mike just said about how he could size people up. He was able to assemble the broadest range of really brilliant people. I mean, a, a present company, you know, Mike being one of them. Um, you know, Scott Connolly, um, Bruce Neller, Patrick Arnold. I mean, th these are just brilliant guys. I mean, um, and more than I'm probably forgetting about Bill Phillips. I mean, and he was able to to somehow utilize all of these relationships on a very high level intellectually to positively or for better or worse, affect our industry. 
And, and I, I think when we, if we were really to distill what we have today down to the most granular level, I think you'd find a lot of those grains were emanate from, from Dan. He, he, was, he, he kind of shaped everything that we kind of, the realm that we kind of live in today, especially among the scientific community. You know, like I said, Neller, Will Brink, Patrick Arnold, Mike Zampano, uh, Scott Connolly, Bill Phillips. These are brilliant guys. And then he had them all in his hand, you know? And, and the, yeah. sad, you know, the sad part of the whole thing is that if Dan would have like applied all that brilliance in a constructive way, not as a rebel or as an outlaw, he probably could have been a multi multi millionaire, right? Well, I, I, I you know, I, I don't know if that's a fair, I don't know if that's a fair assessment. You know, well, we, look at Phillips and look at Connolly, look at all these people, all the money they made off of the backs of guys like Dan Duchesne, you well, know, absolutely. And I mean, you have to be, you have to have a certain acumen in business in order to pull that off. And you know, we all have our strengths, and that wasn't one of Dan's. Um, as far as being an outlaw goes, that just kind of happened. It was part of the deal because we had to be outlaws back in those days. There was no two ways about it. And for the most part, we're still outlaws. So <laughs> that, that's just part. It's, it's, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't romanticize it nor charge him with some kind of nefarious <clears throat> um, you know, image that he was, you know, that he was an outlaw. He liked being a gangster, but there was an awful lot of positive, useful, endear, enduring info and knowledge that came out of that. So, you know, you got to balance it out. But I, I, I wouldn't characterize all of his contributions under this kind of dark cloud or who he was under this dark cloud. He was a really kind, fair, generous, albeit blunt, um, you know, and a loyal, <laughs> loyal friend, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, on what you said, Dave, um, Dan and I actually talked about it because, you know, he could have made a lot of money and he had an opportunity to be a partner of mine, too. And what what Dan said to me was uh, that, you know, black market, he said, black market ruins you for a legitimate business. Black market is just too easy. It's too simple. And he said, legitimate business is complicated. Uh, you've got you, you got to deal with employee problems. You got this. You got Taxes. that. Said, I, Taxes. I just don't want it. You know, he didn't want it. And, we, and we so, argued. You know, we argued about that. I insisted that it's it's the same amount of work, no yeah. matter what color hat you're wearing. And he 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 seemed to think that it was the black hat meant less work. Well, you don't have to. It, it always is helpful when you don't have to pay taxes on the money you make, right? <laughs> yeah, but. No, real business is complicated. I yeah. mean, you're you're dealing with uh, you're dealing with all kinds of issues, and that that you're not dealing with in the black market. Yeah, well, li so liability insurance. <laughs> and you know, black market is complicated too. It's not that simple. There's, you still got to deal with a, a lot of issues. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but Dan didn't want to take it on. He really didn't want to take it on. You know. Salami. F final words. Um, thank you for doing this. Awesome. Uh, I'm glad yeah. that John and Michael are here because they're they're. I, I can remember Dan speaking of both of you guys. Um, and uh, no, I, I, as John also said, I, the things that he did that were were monumentous for what we have today. Maybe we should remember him by that. He was a rebel and and he was a little crazy with his advice, but but the 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 core of him was bringing to the industry so many products uh please google those products everybody you'll go i've used that before i've used that before yeah, you know what i mean absolutely. so uh uh good good and bad you know we've all got good sides and bad sides but uh, if we can look at the the good in dan it was all the, the things he brought to us that we're still using today so you know like i said at the beginning of this i loved him for what he was as a interesting unique human being and he was a little crazy. Look, we all, we all got problems, just some more than others, right? Well, Dan, Dan was a little crazy, but we could always put that aside and really learn from who he really was. So, yeah. And on his death, you know, um, uh, I spoke to him. He said, "I'm going to go to New York, and I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to the theater again." And 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 John, you might know this too. I think he knew he was on his way out with his, his kidneys. Yeah, he actually yeah. he actually called me while he was subletting that 
apartment in Manhattan um, in the theater district. And he, he was almost begging me to come see him. And um, I, was in, I was living in Mexico. I was going through a really horrible custody battle, divorce, kidnapping, the whole everything down there with my ex-wife. And I just, I could not leave. And I really felt from that conversation, that was the last time I talked to him, I really felt from that conversation that, that he, was, he was trying to get me to come to say goodbye or something. He knew, he knew something was up. I mean, Shauna Sale tells the story of him go, going back to Aunt Lorraine's house in, in Maine, and he, he just slept for like three days in his old bedroom. You know, there was clearly something wrong with him. But yeah. What, what, one thing, at least John will appreciate, I don't know if Mike was privy to it, but um, I would love to get my hands on one of those dinosaur baby dolls that he had, you know, collected <laughs> towards the Yeah, end. he had some great bike stuff. I was like, man, the bike stuff he had was amazing, you know, because he, he couldn't just get a normal bike. He had to build his own. So, you know, as being a cyclist, I was like, oh, and, and you know, his antique stereo stuff he loved and the muscle cars, right? It was crazy. So I actually, I actually took over the Cobra that he was building. He actually gave no. He he was he was building this Cobra when he got his second beef, and um, he said, "You want to finish this for me?" I said, "Sure." So I towed it to my house. Wow. And, he had one in Carlsbad at his house when I went to see him right before he passed away. I wonder if that's that might be the one. No, I was a Lotus Seven. He had. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. He had a cover. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was okay. covered up. I didn't see any kick cars. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. yeah kick cars. You see Cobra at one point, and yeah, he was he was into it, and he loved cycling. He liked yes. uh, recumbent bikes, but yeah, and uh, yeah, I, you know the the whole thing with the dolls. I didn't know about that until he passed. Um, and uh, what were the dolls? what was the deal with the dolls? Remember, remember the dinosaur cartoon? You know the babies. Yeah. Said, Mama, yeah. You know. What I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, the, for that, that he had an some kind of affliction for those things. Oh. Affinity for him. Anyway. Oh, you yeah. know what? That's not true. He did tell me about him one time after he got out of uh, prison the first time. I went to visit him. And he showed me, and he, he made me swear not to tell anybody about it, but he had like 40 of these on his bed, right? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, lined uh, up on the side of the bedroom. <laughs> and he had them in the closets, he had them on the couch, or everywhere. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It's funny. Well, My, he, he loved, uh, you know, he, he loved certain comic books as well, and I, he named his black market business after... Uh, do you guys remember what it was called? Sergeant Rock, I think, was his his uh, surname. Shelley would remember what it was, but um, I don't. Yeah, never, he had I don't remember. Little quirks. <laughs> I, I miss him tremendously. I mean, you guys can say you never had a dull moment around Dan. He was always interesting. He knew a lot about everything. He was eclectic, and uh, yeah, it was a uh, little bit of light went out when he when he passed. You know. I, I was kind of quiet the whole the whole debate, kind of just acted like a moderator because I didn't really never really talk to Dan or had extensive conversation with him in person. But I lived vicariously through his columns that he wrote in the uh, Muscle Media 2000. Um, that had a huge influence on on my thinking processes and and some of the, and how I approached bodybuilding and, and taking drugs and and you know trying to always think outside the box. So in a sense, he was kind of a, a teacher of mine, even though I never really spoke to him in person. And I think that that and, and, and if you think about it, John, I mean, you know, my column in the in, in muscular development, the anabolic freak was really an extension of Dan's column that he had in muscle media. I just kind of took it to MD. I became so, the new steroid guy, you know, uh, or steroid expert at that time when Blackman launched that magazine. And I kind of took over that role. So. He was kind of a mentor in a sense to me. You know, it was probably a good thing that I never knew him in person because I probably would have gotten in trouble with him because I would have been enamored by his, you know, his ideas and I probably would have gotten, you know, caught up in some of his his schemes. So, it was probably good that I kind of was at a distance from him, but I absolutely was was tremendously influenced by a lot of what he wrote in the magazine and mm -hmm. uh, and and how I process it. And I'll tell you something there was no internet back then, but man, did I look forward to that magazine coming every month. I, I would almost like stand by the mailbox waiting for it to come. And when it came, I, I, I couldn't wait to read his column. It was the first thing I went to. 
You know. Yeah, my my rage page in muscular development was the counter to his rant. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. It was interesting. How, okay. And I, I always wanted to do another. what Bill Phillips did. And that was always my goal. And when we got to the point where it was time for me to do that, the magazines really were not as important anymore. So we did it with RX Muscle. So RX Muscle, in a sense, was an extension of Muscle Media 2000. It was like build a media website sell good supplements that you can market through there and, and market other people's good supplements as long as you believe in them. And I think that that's always been our motto at RX Muscle, John, since we launched it. Yep. Uh, make that the next generation muscle media, Dan Duchesne, all that stuff. And, that, and that's really what, you know, that was an extension all because of Dan, Bill, and all those guys, you know, back in, Mike Zampano, of course, huge influence on me, you know, as well. Um, the first company I ever worked for and was sponsored by was Champion Nutrition when, when they had Mike Francois back there. And I remember talking to Mike, oh, yeah. and it was like uh, talking to like, finally it was like someone I could talk to who knew more than me that I could ask questions to. And that to me was, was engaging, you know. You, you know what's amazing to me is that 40-something <clears throat> years ago, I was sitting on a bench in Gold's Gym listening to Mike Zampano give <laughs> <laughs> Sunday school, and now here I am, you know, on a show with him. I mean, it's, <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, those days were incredible. I mean, can you imagine if we'd have just had a camera in the gym? I mean, we had guys like like Magic and Reggie and the Barbarian Twin, oh, yeah. just beat Grimkowski. We had all these characters. You didn't need any more than that. You didn't need a script. You just needed to <laughs> run camera around the gym every day. It, I remember was, sitting on a bench and watch Pete. I mean, Pete Grumkowski was sitting on a bench for the workout and, and he took out a bottle of Anivar from his gym bag and opened the top and just dumped the whole thing. A whole bottle. A whole bottle. <laughs> I don't want to say it, you can get it, but you know, the cereal rep would come to Gold's Gym every month <laughs> and drop off cases of Anivar and Pete would put a bottle of Anivar on his breakfast cereal, you know, they were like sugar pops or something like that. <laughs> Put a bottle on it and take it down. And, you know, Pete would get small in the off season. I mean, he'd have, you know, 15 and a half inch arms in the off season. Yeah. And then in a period of two months, that guy would blow up and he'd have, you know, maybe the second biggest arms in bodybuilding. Wow. You know? and, yeah, he was uh, amazing. But yeah, yeah. And there was more than just all the drug reps used to bring their deliveries to the organ on yeah. yeah, and there was exactly. you know, everybody had their little packages all pre-ordered. That's funny. right. The organ on guys and yeah, uh, yeah right. Yep. It was, it was I'll really tell you about true. a package I got from Michael Zampano once. <laughs> My, I was working for Champion. They were giving me free product. It was when I first started like competing, really. You know, at the at the higher at a higher level. And uh, I remember you had come out with Metmax, which was kind of like a, a, I guess, a response to Metrex at the time. And I was using it, and I was telling him how I loved it. I think I was taking like six packets a day. You're like, I'm going to send you the real good stuff. You sent me a. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. You sent me a, a, a. He sent me this unmarked bag. It was like a big, huge seed bag, and it was I don't know what was in it. It was like Metmax times ten with no flavoring. Only I could have swallowed the stuff. It, it tasted like battery acid because you had no flavor system in it. It, yeah, was it was horrible. Yeah, <laughs> horrible. stuff. If you could keep it down. I man. did. I would do six of those a day. I don't know what you had in there. I was growing like a weed on that. I mean, I was on anabolics too, but I was growing way more than the anabolics yeah. were making me grow. <laughs> yeah, I still don't want to say. <laughs> Michael, uh, I was given uh, the uh, the handbook too by Dan. It was autographed to your mom, and he goes, oh, "This is the only copy I have. Take this one." So <laughs> my, yeah, that, the only because he's looking around his apartment and he's like, "I don't, I don't have a copy." I go, oh, "I'd love to have one." He goes, oh, "Take this one," and it was autographed to your mom. If I find it. I'll give it back to you. It's, right, no, right, 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 it back. it's rightfully yours. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's another no. a funny thing that I had, no, had not then, uh, I, I said we used to sell these uh, copies and we'd, we'd sign some of them. You know, I think it was extra money if you wanted it signed. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. funny. But, that's uh, funny. Uh, but my mom was very close to Dan. And when Dan passed, it was, it was very sad. You know, one more thing I want to say I just thought of was uh, – uh, David Jenkins. You guys remember David Jenkins? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, Dan wanted me to name our, we were working on a protein powder at one time and Dan wanted me to name it designer protein. 
And I was like, that's a weird name, designer protein. <laughs> and he said, no, everything's designer. Everything's Gucci. Everything's Jordache and Calvin Klein and, right. and that. It's a good name. Well, David Jenkins named his product designer protein. And it was a big, big product in the market it's for, huge. for many years. Many you years. Well, yeah. you know, Bill Phillips was marketing it through Muscle Media. That's why it was huge. Did Dan didn't own that company at all? Well, I'm not sure. Oh. I don't. I, I think he had... I think he agreed to a piece of the uh, revenues or something like that. I don't think he owned stock in the company. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Well, Dan will certainly never be forgotten. Uh, he will always be the original steroid guru. No matter who else wants to come out and try to brand themselves as the steroid guru, he will be the original. And I want to thank you guys for joining us today, Mike Zampano, John Salami, and John Romano. It was great. I, I, I think I enjoyed the show probably more than the fans will. And, and you know, the stories were priceless. And uh, I know Dan is probably up there, probably sitting on my shoulder right now, chuckling, saying, man, <laughs> it's about time you guys uh, remembered me. 20 years after his death, he died 20 years ago today. And uh, uh, it, just, it, was, it was really a pleasure to, to hear these stories and bring back these memories. We didn't even scratch the surface, to be no. honest with you. No. <laughs> we could do this again and again. Really? Does anybody know, do any, you might know, John, uh, does anybody know when Dan actually was born, his birthday? No. You know, he didn't, I, I'm not sure, this was, I'm not sure this was his real birthday, but um, he celebrated it on November 6th. So just, uh, you know. We, we kind of lift a glass to him on November 6th. Yeah. So, uh, Dave, if you have a show somewhere around November, we might want to have yeah, a Absolutely. Yeah. Give me a list of topics, guys, bullet points. I'd love to do another one. I know the fans love to hear this stuff. This is the history. To me, the history of bodybuilding is so important to know where we came from because a lot of these guys today don't know anything past the last six months. I mean, they don't even know who – some of the pros from the, 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 the 2000s and the 90s are. It's, it's amazing. So this is where all this stuff came from, all the drug you know, information, all the supplement in information. People think that you know, complex carbohydrates were invented in, in 2018. You know, they, they don't know that you were doing this back in the 70s, Mike. You know? And, and Dave, hey, Dave, David, when are you going to have the Michael Zampano show on? I'm already interested in listening to it. So. <laughs> I've had Mike on, and every time we have him on, it's always a very popular show because he's so interesting. We could talk about your new business, Mike, right? I mean, that, that's, yeah. uh, that's yeah. super interesting. Yeah. All right, but I'm going to wrap this up. We're out of time now. We'll, we'll absolutely have to come back and do this again. Thank you guys for joining us for another installment of RX Muscles History of Bodybuilding.